I'm uh, was giving this very nice and very open uh, title, so uh, so I can just uh, tell you about uh, things that I think uh, are the most interesting ones uh, going on uh, in the field of uh, of bone and calcium metabolism. So I will um, just let you know that I've been working with some of the companies um, in the field. Um, but apart from that, um, I'll first focus a bit on osteoporosis and what is going on in the field of osteoporosis, and then I'll carry on and talk a bit about um, what is going on in the rare bone diseases, uh, which is sudden, just over the last years, have been catching up when it comes to new developments, actually. Um, my view on osteoporosis is that we've maybe seen it uh, too, sim it's too simplistic uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. We were all very excited when we had the new definition of osteoporosis process being a T-score uh, of the spine or hip less than minus 2.5, but maybe this is um, too simplistic. So, um, so we'll talk a bit about the, the individual patients and um, the individual approach uh, to that. I'll talk a bit about uh, current treatments. I'll talk about treatment choice, treatment breaks, and target to treat, uh, treat to target, and a couple of things I'll leave out due to time, and then something about new and upcoming treatments. So first of all, I think it's very important that we see our patients as individuals. Um, they come with different gender, different age, they have a different lifestyle background. Some of them have many comorbidities, some of them have none, and some of them receive other pharmacological treatments. And there might also be something about genetics, and we haven't really figured that out, although uh, Jose and, and myself and many other people have been working uh, on this topic for more than 20 years. Then, of course, the disease come in different uh, flavors. Uh, it can be simple with no fractures yet, or it can be a very complicated uh, disease. And then we have to decide on the different treatments. Just to um, mention a few um, of the studies we, we and Santander and uh, Jose have been involved in. Uh, it's based on the, the European and now worldwide uh, collaboration, initially the GFOS, but now the Genomos um, studies. Um, and Many papers have come out, papers telling about which BMD uh, loci uh, are important for BMD, but there's now also coming out papers talking about which um, uh, genetic variants might be important for fractures. And this is a paper coming out a couple of years ago looking at genetic risk factors for vertebral fractures. Um, and this is the Manhattan plot um, that shows you that we had one significant world uh, genome-wide um, significant hit. It was on chromosome uh, 16. And as you can see, if you are a carrier um, of this variant, your risk of a vertebral fracture is increased by 70%. If you're homozygous uh, for this mutation, you almost have a six-fold increased risk in this very big study for having vertebral fractures. Um, unfortunately, um, the hit here is not uh, like in a very narrow spot. Um, it's, it's quite wide. It's not particularly in a single gene. Um, but this locus has actually been also associated with a, a syndrome or um, a, a group of diseases. Uh, they're all grouped into what is called bacterial. It's association of birth defects, including vertebral body defects, but lots of other defects, cardiovascular as well. Um, and, and this particular region was involved in, in the studies demonstrated where bone mineral density uh, was determined, which, uh, gene, which genetic variants bone mineral density uh, was determined about. And, and maybe this uh, specific gene is of interest because it's highly expressed in bone. It regulates bone uh, morphogenetic protein and thereby um, osteoblasts. Then we moved on and said, okay, vertebral fractures is one thing, but uh, of course what is most important for the patients would be the clinical vertebral fractures, and can we identify uh, genes that are responsible for this? Um, and again, it's, it's from the same group um, of, of people, but not too many of the groups, not nearly as many as in the first study, had information about clinical vertebral fractures, because that actually demands that you have been talking to the patients and know if the fracture was painful. Uh, so, here, so the study was small but it consisted of a discovery uh, cohort and a confirmation cohort. And as you can see, it all kind of tended in the same direction for this uh, specific um, loci. It was lo it's located now on chromosome 2. 
And again, you can see very unfortunately the hit is 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 here, uh, but it's it's like in a very uh, it's a very wide peak, so it's not very easy to figure out um, what exactly is the underlying uh, gene. So more work is being done um, on that on the at the moment. It was actually also a loci that previously been associated with bone mineral density, so it it kind of comes together. So I'll come back a little later to more genetics, but for the time being, I'll turn to treatment and what is going on uh, here. Uh, so currently, you know, we have two options, antiresorptive, which is what we use the most, and anabolic uh, treatment. And antiresorptives would, in most cases, be bisphosphonate or rank uh, ligand antibody, which is uh, denosumab. And then currently in Europe, uh, we only have one anabolic option, a teropeptide. In the US, a new anabolic option uh, called a belopeptide has been approved and is uh, on the market there. So I'll show you a bit about that. We don't know yet if it's going to make it um, to Europe. Uh, the company Radius Health, uh, which is producing a belopeptide, have not decided. Uh, really if they want to come to Europe as well. First of all, the drugs we have actually work quite well on average. Uh, so this is from a, a not so very not so old review and it, I can recommend this review if you want to read about osteoporosis treatment and and here you can see the the BMD curves for the most commonly used uh, antiresorptives so it's denosumab in red solidronic acid in blue and alendronate in green and you can already here see a thing that we will come back to that when we treat with bisphosphonates we have a, a rapid increase in bone mineral density at the beginning but then it kind of levels off after three to four years and then you um, have more or less a stable BMD, you cannot expect BMD to continue to increase over time with the bisphosphonate. Whereas that seems to be different with the Nusumab. There seems to be a continuing increase in bone mineral density at both the spine and hip, and I'll come back to that um, a little later. So BMD, of course, is one thing. What is most important for our patients would be fractures. Um, and, and here you can see non vertebral fractures, and we have good evidence that the newer bisphosphonates actually uh, inhibits fractures. We have good evidence that denosumab inhibits fractures and also teropeptides. Uh, so we can use all of these drugs because they work. And the same goes for hip fracture for the antiresorptives. We have quite good evidence for at least alendronate, resitronate, and solidronic acid and denosumab. There were very few patients in the teropeptide study that suffered hip fractures, so therefore that was not for statistically significant. So what about long-term data? Uh, our patients need treatment for more than three years, uh, most of them anyway, and uh, do we have long-term data? We do have long-term data for um, the bisphosphonates and uh, denosumab. This is the uh, alendronate, uh, the initial trial, uh, and, and how it was continued, a continued increase in bone mineral density at the lumbar spine for up to 10 years, suggesting that the drug doesn't stop working. As it's been said, you, many people say you should only treat for five years because it doesn't work any longer. Yes, it, it continued to work. It continues to inhibit uh, bone resorption and maintain or even increase bone mineral density. You can see at the hip side, it's, it's over the long run, there's a maintenance of bone mineral density, um, whereas people who stop treatment will um, reduce bone mineral density again and go back towards baseline. Importantly, again, for the patients would be fracture, and we'll come ba back back to this uh, in uh, when we talk about treatment breaks. But um, the the discovery here was there was no difference in the risk of non vertebral fractures in the years five to ten um, if you have had a previous uh, treatment with alendronate, whether you stopped or continued. But you can also appreciate that uh, patients stopping treatment started to have or suffer new clinical vertebral fractures uh, when they stopped the treatment, whereas the women continued treatment treatment had a lower risk um, of these fractures. Similar studies have been done with solidronic acid. Uh, for, um, for the Nusumab, we have one study demonstrating up to 10 years of e efficacy and also safety. And you can see it, it's clearly different, uh, whereas uh, the increase in lumbar spine with alendronate was approximately 7-8%. Uh, After 10 years, it's 22% with uh, denosumab. Uh, so the red line here is the, the initial placebo group um, that catches up uh, when these patients also started on treatment. So it's not a placebo-controlled trial for, for 10 years because this would be unethical. It's only placebo-controlled for the first three years. And here you can see vertebral fractures. Uh, 
the dark blue uh, would be uh, the placebo group and the lighter blue would be the actively treated patients. And you can see how nicely uh, fracture risk goes down very rapidly when it comes to vertebral fractures and stays down for, for up to 10 uh, years. Similarly, at the hip, after 10 years, you have an increase of almost 10% um, at the hip and you have a not so rapid uh, reduction, but it, it takes a bit more time, and we know that from many other studies, it takes a bit more time to prevent non vertebral fractures. Uh, but that is coming also nicely uh, along and stay, and the risk of non vertebral fractures stays down for up to 10 years. It's also demonstrated to be safe uh, for up to 10 years. So how come that bone mineral density can continue to increase with one anti-resorptive treatment and not with another? We don't know that yet based on human studies, but there's been done studies in monkeys um, and, and just focus on this column here where they looked at trabecular bone. So these were monkeys that were sham operated and didn't have any uh, drugs at all. So you can see a bit of activity, the red and blue lines here are bone uh, forming activity. You can see if you over these monkeys, uh, then they become like postmenopausal women, lots of activity as we know, increased uh, bone turnover and that will um, because of their age, uh, just lead to bone loss. You can see you can prevent that completely if you treat with uh, denosumab. So then there's no activity and therefore no bone loss. But that would not increase bone mineral density. But then, and this is a, again a slightly complicated, but just focus on, I will just focus initially here. Uh, so this is the hip. So these animals were killed, so we can have a look at the whole hip, which is usually not something we can when we look at biopsies. Uh, but then they focused on the cortical areas. And you can see in these uh, intact animals, there's quite a lot of activity going on at the cortical sites. Uh, that, that is, of course, maintained in if you over the animals. But the interesting thing is, it's also maintained if you treat these over animals with denosumab. So you take away all the activity going on in the tobacular bone, but it looks like you leave the modeling-based uh, activity taking place on the cortical sites intact. So the current thinking, but it's based on animal models um, and it hasn't been proven in, in humans uh, yet, is if we just focus uh, on, on this figure here. So the continued increase in bone mineral density is explained by the black box, which is the same box as we see with bisphosphonates, where you have a very rapid increase in bone mineral density just because you close down remodeling. So all the bone that was temporarily removed due to remodeling is now back in the bone and, and that kind of, it, that that happens over a few years time and then it stays stable and that is probably why there's not a continued increase with bisphosphonates. Then you have some secondary mineralization. Older bone is more mineralized than new bone and that is probably also taking place both with uh, denosumab and bisphosphonates. But then the thing that is special or we think it's special uh, for denosumab is that allowance of ongoing bone modeling. Uh, so and that will give the uh, steady increase in bone mineral density. Teropeotide um, is another treatment and, and of course we don't have long-term data with teropeotide because we can only use it for up to 24 months. Uh, I just wanted to uh, show this and highlight uh, that it is important that you treat as long as possible because we know especially for the effect on non vertebral fracture, uh, we add uh, an effect every month uh, we treat. Okay, so now we move on to treatment choice and the reason why I, I thought I would talk about this is because there have come two new studies that are very exciting because they are head-to-head -head studies, anti-resorptives versus anabolic treatment. And, you know, this is always the question or has been the question since teropeotide came to the market. Is it actually better than an anti-resorptive? It's more expensive, it's more... Uh, troublesome for the patients, but is it actually better? The first hint we got is from this study, uh, now already uh, seven years old. It was a back pain study where the authors wondered if teropeotide prevented back pain or cured back pain better than resitronate do did. And uh, there were no difference in back pain. So don't don't use teropeotide for back pain. Uh, it won't work better than an anti-resorptive. But of course they saw um, larger increases in bone mineral density with teropeotide, which is not a surprise. But this was a relatively small study, only 700 women. But the cells saw a significant reduction in new vertebral fractures in the women treated with teropeotide uh, compared uh, to the women treated with uh, resitronate. 
And they also saw that uh, the women treated with teropeptide was more likely to have milder fractures, whereas women treated with residronate, if they had fract fractures, they were more likely to be severe. So one of the new studies that was just published uh, end of last year is called the VERO trial. It's a head-to-head -head study of teropeptide and recitronate for two years in patients with severe osteoporosis. So these would be the patients that at least I would be wondering, uh, would, would I treat this patient with teropeptide or continue or give the patient an, an antiresorptive? So you can see the patients were on average 73, 72 years old. They had osteopenia uh, at the hip and also osteopenia at the spine. And you might say, why? Are they, are they then really severely affected osteoporosis patients? They were severely affected because, as you can see, 100% of the patients had a previous vertebral fracture. And that is, and they, some of them had been treated before, and that is probably the reason why BMD is not lower uh, than it is. On average, 2.7 uh, vertebral fractures when they entered uh, into this study. And I'll just jump right to the results, which I think is very exciting. So you can see after 12 months and after 24 months, there was a significant better reduction in fractures in the patients treated with teropeptide compared to the patients treated with uh, recitronate. Uh, and that was um, the secondary endpoint uh, was clinical fractures. Uh, so that would be painful vertebral fractures and fractures of arms and legs. And, uh, and you can also see here, and I, I apologize, it should be 6, 12, 18, 24 months here. Uh, and you can see already after six months, the curve starts to diverse. And there is a significant better uh, uh, protection against clinical fractures with teropeptide compared to uh, recitronate. Looking specifically at non vertebral fractures, um, the study just missed uh, being significant, uh, but the curves uh, look very similar. So I think uh, that is very promising. We know that they're, they're probably with teropeptide compared to recitronate is an advantage uh, in choosing teropeptide. And just at the same time, one month apart, uh, this study was published. Uh, uh, Romososumab, which is new, it's, it's an anabolic, but it's also an antiresorptive, and I'll come back to it um, in a moment. But it's, it's, it's an anabolic treatment, and that was compared, again, head-to-head -head with a strong antiresorptive, alendronate, uh, for fracture prevention in, in women with severe osteoporosis. And this is very busy. You're not supposed to be reading it, but these patients were slightly older, 74 years uh, older, all of them had vertebral fractures, and on average, they had an osteoporotic um, uh, BMD level. And coming to uh, the BMD results, you can see it's very impressive. It's the most impressive uh, response to treatment in osteoporosis we've seen ever. So within one year, there's an increase in lumbar spine BMD of almost 14%. Uh, at the hip side, uh, it increases by 6%. The study was um, head to head for one year, and then all the patients received alendronate the continuing uh, year. So you can see the, the major increases here with Romo, and then it's stabilized uh, over time with alendronate. You can also see the very interesting pattern of, of bone turnover markers with this treatment. There's a rapid increase in P1 and P, which is a marker of bone formation. But although the patients continue to be treated for up to 12 months, the, the increase in PNP only stays above baseline uh, for the first six months, and then it goes away. So there's a self-limitation uh, of this treatment when it comes to bone formation. Uh, you can also see that it actually is dual acting because there is a reduction in CTX, which is a marker of bone resorption. Importantly, fractures, uh, this is what we're looking for. So this is vertebral fractures at months 12, significant reduction in the patients treated with Romo compared to alendronate. That was also the case after 24 months. There was a 27% reduction in any clinical fractures and a 19% reduction in non vertebral fractures, and that was actually significant. So now we have two head-to-head -head studies comparing anabolic versus antiresorptive, demonstrating that in severely affected patients, anabolic, pa anabolic treatment is probably um, the best choice. So what then about uh, treatment breaks? Um, you know, this has been an ongoing discussion. Should patients continue treatment or should they not? I would just like to state very clearly that you should only consider treatment breaks in patients uh, treated with bisphosphonate. And I'll come back to the issue with uh, denuzumab um, in a minute. 
So the whole discussion about treatment breaks was based on, on this curve. Um, again, from the continued alendronate study called the FLEX, uh, you see there was no added benefit in prevention of non-vertebral fractures continuing more than five years uh, with alendronate. Again, I have to remind you that there was an added benefit on clinical vertebral fractures. So if you stop, uh, if you stop alendronate after five years compared to continue uh, for five years, there is an increased risk of vertebral fractures. Is that important? Um, these are data from uh, a study done a long ago showing that the days of limited activity is the same for a clinical spinal fracture as it is for hip fracture. So for the patients and uh, their ability to live their daily life, uh, it's equally important to suffer clinical uh, vertebral fractures. But of course, we have to consider the risk of long-term treatment, and the risk would be atypical femur fractures. And this is how we usually look at these uh, numbers. So, so there's a very uh, big increase in relative risk of these fractures if you continue bisphosphonate beyond five years. But sometimes we have to think in absolute risk of fractures. And if you look at absolute risk of fractures, it's still only one in 1,000 uh, individuals uh, after five years or with more than five years. So you can say if you stop treatment after five years, we know there will be a reduction in the risk of atypical femur fractures. So we will decrease the risk from one per thousand to 0 0.3 per thousand. You could say that would be rare from rare to rare. My colleague Bo, Bo Abrahams in Denmark, you know, we have a lot of registers in Denmark, like I believe you have here in Spain, but he looked at um, more than 60,000 um, alendronate users in, in Denmark, and actually more than uh, almost 2,500 have been taking alendronate for more than 10 years. And he saw, first of all, which is important, that there is a continuing protection against uh, hip fractures in patients taking alendronate a uh, long time, for long term. What he also saw is that if you stop alendronate after, um, after five years uh, compared to continue for up to 10 years, that would cause 26 hip fractures and you would prevent one subtrochanteric fracture. And since this is a register-based uh, study, we don't know if that one atypical or that subtrochanteric fracture would be an atypical uh, fracture. We know most of them are not anyway. So it, will be, it would cause 26 hip fractures and pre prevent less than one. So, but still, I think if, if there's not a big risk of fracture, of course, you should consider stopping treatment. And then, of course, how can we guide the patients and ourselves in that decision? And from the FLEX study, the alendronate study, the only thing that came out as a predictor of who would suffer new fractures was actually tertiles of BMD uh, at the time of stopping treatment. So the lower the BMD, the higher the risk uh, of a new fracture uh, when you stop. There were no, uh, you could not predict anything from measuring uh, bone turnover markers at baseline. But I think we have to remember that these women were in a clinical trial and therefore probably more compliant um, than most patients. So therefore, the current recommendation is that if you consider treatment breaks, it should be after five years of alendronate or three years of sol, and hip BMD should now be better than minus 2.5. The patient should um, not have suffered fracture during treatment, and they should probably not have had vertebral fractures at any time. And then there's suddenly, if you stop treatment, then the next problem arises, and that is what to do next. And we don't know. Um, the FLEX study does not give us any clue how to follow up and how to, when to restart treatment. But clinical practice, I think, is to monitor BMD uh, and reinstall treatment if BMD starts uh, to decrease again. If you're fortunate enough to have biochemical markers of bone turnover, you can also uh, consider starting treatment again if they are no longer uh, suppressed. So the other issue is, of course, uh, denosumab, and the, the take-home message is don't stop denosumab treatment because uh, we know uh, if you stop the treatment, as here uh, in this uh, line, you will activate uh, bone uh, resorption very much. That will lead to bone loss, and there are now also case reports out there that it might lead to an increased risk of vertebral fractures in the month or the first year after stopping uh, treatment. So, so that is probably not something we should do. Uh, of course, sometimes you're maybe forced to do it, and, and this is a very small study, but 
these are as good as they come at the moment um, uh, from uh, New Zealand, where women who were in the freedom study and treated with denuzumab for seven years were stopped with denuzumab. And then uh, they gave the, the patients one infusion of solidronic acid, thinking that this might stop uh, or prevent the bone loss. But as you can see, it only partly prevents it, um, the bone loss at the lumbar spine, and it certainly did not prevent the bone loss um, at the hip side. So currently, we, we don't know uh, how to stop denuzumab. The good thing is that we have 10 year safety data, so you can continue your patients um, at the moment. We and others are doing studies now trying to figure out the timing of the sol or if what else can be done if, if we have to stop and, and change the patients to something else. Then I want to say a bit about uh, treat to target, uh, because that has been an issue. You know, we've just started patients on treatment and said, keep on treatment or keep on treatment for five years. But of course, there's been an interest in could we define a goal? Um, and I know, of course, the most important thing for the patients would be absence of fracture. But that is not a very easy goal to measure as we go along. So therefore, of course, it has been suggested, could it be BMD? Could it be bone turnover? Could it be something else? And we know that bone mineral density in untreated patient is a very good marker of the risk of hip fracture. Uh, as bone mineral density goes down, the risk of fracture goes up. But this, is this also the case in treated patients? And we know from the previous studies that uh, the, the decrease in fracture risk explained by BMD is 50% um, for hip fractures with denuzumab, it's 40% with solidronic acid. So, so it's not the complete uh, story, uh, but it's better so explained when it comes to vertebral fractures. There's, there's a big working group uh, going on, initiated by the uh, NIH, where they're looking for whether hip BMD changes could uh, predict a fracture outcome. Um, and it looks like it does. So, so these are all the different clinical studies that have been done. And, as, and you can see the bigger the BMD change, uh, the bigger the reduction in fracture uh, rate. So this is still ongoing and we don't know the full answer, so I'll just skip this one. But I'll show you a few, to me, interesting slides from, uh, from the Freedom Study. Uh, so, so these are the overall uh, data. Uh, so you can see this is the risk of fracture and this is the BMD at the time of fracture. So you can see if you reduce uh, or if you increase BMD, reduce your, your T-score uh, to a less uh, minus value, then uh, you, you, it looks like you reach a plateau. So maybe we won't prevent any further fractures once we have increased hip BMD above minus 1.5. And of course, it's interesting to know, is this kind of uh, a rigorous a figure? And here you can see if you split the, the population up uh, to uh, women above and women below 70, it's almost on top of each other. So it looks like uh, minus 2 or minus 1.5 is a magic point. But what about then if patients had a prior fracture or no prior fractures? The, here comes the difference. Uh, so patients with a prior fracture, they will always have a higher risk of fracture than patients without a previous fracture. And that's why we should focus on fracture patients. But still, the curves are similar. They're just at a different level. So it, it still looks as when you reach minus 1.5, you probably won't gain anything more. So, so um, a goal, a suggested goal, has been a T-score of minus 1.5 at the hip side. Um, so I'll just uh, quickly turn to new and upcoming treatments. Um, a baloperitide is a PTH-related peptide analog. Um, it has been uh, um, investigated in a study compared to placebo, and there was also an open-label teriparatide arm um, in that study. And you can see the two drugs that are very similar in many aspects. They prevent vertebral fractures to the same extent, they prevent non-vertebral fractures to the same extent, and they prevent clinical fractures to the same extent. It looks like in this study there was a slight difference uh, in the ability to prevent major osteoporotic fractures, which are humerus and hip and so on. Uh, it also, this is very busy, uh, um, but it seems like a baloperitide induces a bit more dizziness and a bit more nausea than we are used to with teriparatide, but it certainly uh, gives rise to less uh, hypercalcemia than we uh, sometimes see with, um, with a teriparatide. <coughs> 
think I'll just skip this, and move to uh, romososumab, uh, which is a whole new um, uh, type of treatment. It's a sclerostin uh, antibody, and sclerostin has uh, several um, uh, actions uh, in the bone. So first of all, uh, the main action of sclerostin is to inhibit bone formation. It tells the bone that now bone formation is to, uh, come to an end, the resorption lacuna is now filled, so please stop further activity. That is the main activity. But it actually also uh, stimulates the production of rank ligand that will recruit new osteoclasts. So it inhibits formation and it stimulates uh, resorption. So therefore, of course, it's not uh, difficult to guess what will happen if you inhibit uh, sclerostin. You will stimulate bone formation and you will reduce uh, bone resorption. This has been tested head-to-head -head with placebo for one year and then followed with a second year of denusumab. And again, here you can see the dual action. There's an increase in bone formation marker and a reduction in bone resorption marker. So this is a, a whole new thing. We've never had a real dual action uh, drug uh, for osteoporosis before. And as I showed you in the ARCH study, there's a very prominent increase in lumbar spine BMD and total hip uh, BMD. And it reduces uh, vertebral fractures uh, very nicely. Uh, it also uh, reduces clinical fractures, but much to everybody's surprise, there was only a borderline uh, significant in, uh, decrease in the risk of non vertebral fractures, which means that all of the effects seen uh, at this side of the line is actually not something we should pay attention to. And it's interesting, uh, but it turned out that although the women in Latin America had a very low bone mass, they did not fracture. And because they constituted 40% of the whole group, that was probably the reason why the reduction seen in the rest of the world in non vertebral fractures was not significant um, in the overall group. The study was continued, as I said, for another year with uh, denusumab in both groups, and I'll just skip to the fracture, just to say to show you that the fracture risk reduction was uh, maintained um, over uh, the second year. Uh, but again, it, it just almost reached significant for non-vertebral fractures. Um, so, but still, uh, so we now, and, and one thing that is probably important to remember about romososumab, that is, it, it does not stimulate recruitment of osteoblast. And therefore, in this uh, RAD model, where we see uh, malignant bone tumors, if you treat for a long time in high doses with uh, teroperitide or with in intact PTH and also with a belloperitide, actually, we see bone tumors. We don't see that with romososumab. Uh, so it's probably a drug that we will be allowed to use more than once, which is good for the more severely affected patients. So I'll just remind you again about the head-to-head -head study uh, between romososumab and alendronate um, that showed superiority to alendronate. And you might ask, so why is this drug not available uh, currently? And that was because in the head-to-head -head study with alendronate, there was this imbalance in uh, serious cardiovascular events, 50 uh, in the romososumab group compared to 38 um, in, uh, in the alendronate group. This is currently being investigated uh, by um, especially the FDA. Uh, um, so, so that is why it's not approved yet uh, for, for treatment. How am I doing on time? So how long do I have? Five minutes? Good. Because I just wanted to highlight that there's also things going on in the area of rare bone diseases. Um, I put new in brackets because actually we have not had treatment before for these uh, rare bone diseases, hypoparathyroidism, hypophosphatasia, and X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. So um, substitution therapy for hypoparathyroidism with intact parathyroid hormone was investigated in this study called the REPLACE study. It's 134 uh, women and men, um, and they were treated for 24 weeks. Uh, this is just the baseline characteristics. But what, you, what we saw in that study was that if you add um, PTH 1 to, 84, 1 to 84 to the treatment, the patient could reduce the intake of calcium. It could reduce the intake of active uh, vitamin D. Uh, and it also reduced, uh, so this is a bit, uh, it, but it, it maintained um, the urinary uh, calcium excretion. So just to, there was a, a follow-up study done called the REPEAT, and that is 
which is probably slightly worrying uh, because they continue, they put, they increased the dose and they saw a further decrease in the need for calcium supplementation and 125 supplementation. But of course, what they also saw was that these patients who had a very low bone turnover uh, for many, many years, they now had activated bone turnover. And, and we don't really know the long-term outcome uh, of these studies. And it is a very, very expensive treatment. It's called NADPAR. And I think um, it has not found its clinical relevant uh, precision at the moment. At least we are not allowed to treat patients with it uh, in Denmark because it's so expensive. Another new thing that uh, is uh, coming out is borosumab. It's an antibody against FGF23 uh, for XLH. And XLH is an inborn error of metabolism where you have very high levels of FGF23. And what does that mean? Yeah, FGF23 exerts its main effect on the kidneys where it uh, leads to um, um, uh, loss of phosphate. Uh, so therefore, the patients have hypophosphatemia. It also leads to a reduced level of active uh, vitamin D. So in this study, uh, they treated the patients, adult patients, uh, and they saw a steady increase in, in plasma phosphate. Uh, they also saw a better reabsorption of phosphate, and they saw an increase in 125. But again, that is only biochemistry, and we don't know the price for this drug. Um, so um, I just, I'm just coming... Uh, from the ENDO uh, meeting in the US in Chicago. And there they presented data for the, uh, 20, the 40, uh, 48 weeks uh, open label uh, extension of this study. And um, more than normalized uh, plasma phosphate, they saw a reduced pain and use of painkillers in these patients, improved stiffness and WOMAC physical function score. And these patients have fractures that are very unlikely uh, to heal or very difficult to get to heal. And they actually saw better healing. Uh, so that might be the main indication for using this drug. Finally, uh, one of the most beautiful stories that have come out uh, in, in our area uh, over the last uh, years is the alpha, uh, the alpha taste alpha story, uh, the treatment for hypophosphatasia. Uh, it's, it's another inborn error of metabolism where you have a loss of function a mutation in the tissue non-specific isoenzyme of alkaline phosphatase, and that enzyme controls mineralization um, of the bones, so therefore um, the patients have um, hypermineralized bone. And there's a very severe uh, perinatal uh, form um, with very severe rickets, and I'll just show you um, um, a very now very famous study. Um, so it's not an active control study. Of course, you cannot do this because these patients are dying. So they used historical controls. Um, and here you can see the survival of the patients, these very severely affected perinatal patients, survival of these patients when they're treated with alpha taste, uh, alpha compared to the historical controls. And, and again, this is a busy slide, but this just gives you the image that all the patients uh, in the historical cohort, with the exception of one, died uh, just because of breeding complications. And these are the more severely affected that were on breeding, um, uh, aided breeding uh, during the red bars. But you can see just a few of them actually died. Most of them are still alive. And here are the less affected ones that are doing quite well and all, um, all are alive. And these are just images of one of these children. You can see uh, this is a new, uh, very newborn or newly diagnosed baby with hardly any cut, uh, with hardly any um, mineral in the bones and how the bones, the ribs, gets more and more mineralized as the treatment go along and how this baby comes off uh, ventilatory support and can now breathe by itself. Unfortunately, this is also a very, very expensive uh, treatment, but, uh, and there's a discussion whether it should be used in the less severe forms, but uh, we'll probably know more about that uh, shortly. So just to sum up, I think we need to take a personal approach uh, to the management of osteoporosis. We need to think about uh, treat to target, and I think there will be much more um, coming out on that topic. Um, we need to make the right choice of treatment for our patients and think about that, there are, that for severely affected patients, uh, anabolic treatment is probably um, better than anti-resorptives. Uh, and then there are the two knee treatments I talked to you about, abeloperitide, very similar to teroperitide. Uh, it's not still available in Europe, so and we don't know if it will be available. And romososumab, the, the very new uh, drug, uh, still not available, but uh, the interesting thing is here that it has a, very, a completely new mechanism um, of action. <laughs> 
And then I told you about these four, these three rare diseases where we now have the prospect of treatment of at least the most severely um, affected patients. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>